Dr. A. Glasser uh, attended undergraduate school at State College of New York in uh, Stony Brook, and he went on to attend podiatric medical school in the New York College of Podiatric Medicine, graduating in 1983. He established, literally in his garage, the Soul Support Orthotic Company, and in the last five to ten years has built it into the fifth or sixth largest orthotic resource in the world. I don't believe he'll mind if I mention to you right up front that um, not everything he will go over with you is in harmony with what you have been taught. At the beginning of our presentation, in the first day of class in biomechanics, you may recall that I told you that what differentiates you from your academic colleagues at Nova Southeastern School of Osteopathic Medicine and University of Miami School of Allopathic Medicine is biomechanics. Now, we've tried on occasion to, to discuss with you that there are alternative theories, and if you go back through your mental review of our, our lectures, you, you may recall a number of times I mentioned to you alternative points of views on things, but you really didn't get a chance to hear a strong alternative point of view over the course of time. And so we want you today, now at the end of your two semesters worth of training, to listen to alternative points of view, to listen to um, ideas that are on the cutting edge, which are very likely um, an evolutionary improvement over the original ideas. Oftentimes, it's been my experience that when we discuss things that we think we're at odds over, when we really break them down into the core of what they're all about, we're in fact believing the same essence but using different terminology to define it. And so what we're really arguing over is terminology more than, than de facto reality. Um, Dr. Glasser has done his presentation a number of places. A lot of people who are strongly Russian inclined disagree with some of his perspectives. Um, I think in dissecting what he says, that if you look at the core of it, it's really not that far away from what we believe. Um, in the process of listening to him, kind of contrast what he has to say. And by the way, he's very open to discussion. If you if you want to um, point out what you feel is is, uh, is different or, or maybe, I, I can't imagine that you disagree with him, but, you know, if you find something about what he says that you'd like to elaborate on, uh, he's very open to doing that. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Thank you very much. I'm going to teach you a little bit different way of looking at biomechanics. And I have to say, uh, meeting Chip in uh, Dr. Sutherland in uh, Merida, Mexico, I was really going down there to sit and talk with him about biomechanics. That was the reason I went. And I went in many ways thinking myself I would shift his paradigm. And in actuality, he shifted mine. So <laughs> I learned a tremendous amount. And he gave me some reading to do. and. And I realized how similar our thinking really was, but just coming at it from a different point of view. So I want you to not only look at the differences here, but look at some of the similarities. And I've thrown in some of the theorems of foot compensation to show how well they fit with what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm going to show you is my theory of foot biomechanics, which we call the mass posture theory. Several studies have shown that the vast majority of people out there are pronators, about 95% of people, depending on where you draw the line, pronate a little too much. 1% uh, are ideal, and 4% don't pronate enough. Of course, that, that's really determined by how, where you put your divisions. So it's a, it's a matter of opinion, and many, many articles, of course, are going to disagree on that. Why do we pronate so much? Why do so many of us become overpronators? many, many reasons. One is some people have tremendous ligamentous laxity, Ehlers-Danlos disease, Marfan syndrome. The ligaments aren't supporting the arch, so it collapses. Gravity is bringing us down. So we have, we're being pulled down to the earth. The hard, flat, unvaried terrain we walk on has a tendency to cause us to pronate more and more over time. Sedentary lifestyles mean we don't use our musculature enough to support the longitudinal arch. Tight calf-induced overpronation, and I just mentioned this is theorem number four from the seven theorems. This is equinus. 
that if you pull too hard on the posterior aspect of the calcaneus, the foot flattens out. And I will, throughout the lecture, I'm going to kind of bring up where the theorems of compensation really fit into these ideas. Because as he said, we're not that far apart when you really look at it. Trauma causes pronation. How hard do you push on that brake pedal just before impact and flatten out your foot? But the one that I like to spend a little time on is the embryologic development of the human foot. The limb buds emerge four to six weeks after conception in the frontal plane. They begin to rotate toward the sagittal plane. At one point, you're plantar to plantar in the mid-sagittal plane. At birth, you're starting to rotate down to the transverse plane, and at birth, you're at approximately 45 degrees inverted to the transverse plane. Luckily, we don't have to walk at birth. We have nine to 15 months before we take a single step. At three and a half years old, you've reached about 90% of your adult position. At five and a half, the rotation is complete. The vast majority of, of us are left in a slightly inverted position, and that's the position that Mert Root defined as rear foot varus. By looking down at the heel, he noticed that people had an inverted position. One of the things that I thought was missing from classical biomechanics, the way I was taught it, was that there was a lot of discussion on biomechanics, but nobody had actually defined what are we trying to accomplish? What are our goals of biomechanics? Although Mert, Mert Root did describe what he called the ideal foot, which was good. But what are, we, what are the things that we would like a good functional foot to exhibit? Well, one of the things that I've noticed is that people that overpronate generally hit the ground in less supination. Now, to understand that, I went to the Smithsonian Institute and looked at about 210 calcanei and measured the angulation of all three facets. And one of the things I noticed was when the anterior facet of the subtalar joint is level, the calcaneus is inverted. So in supination, inversion is part of supination, the anterior facet is level. What does that mean? It means the momentum of the human body is coming down and striking a perpendicular. Do an experiment. Get up some speed and run straight into the wall. You're not going to bounce left or right. You'll bounce back. What happens when you hit the ground in less supination? The anterior facet is tilted. The momentum of the human body runs into a tilted anterior facet, which drives you into early, rapid, deep pronation. So our goal would be not to have a foot like this that hits the ground, rolls in, and collapses in the midfoot, but to have a foot, instead of heel striking here with the anterior facet tilted, heel strikes in adequate supination so the anterior facet is fairly level. Why? Because it creates this time delay in pronation. And the time delay is enough to lift the bottom graph up to the normal graph. So what I'm saying is the goal is to prepare the foot to hit the ground, not to wait till the foot hits the ground to first attempt to control it. Second problem, at mid-stance, most people are coming over, most pronators are coming over an unlocked foot, which is theorem six, four foot compensation. We come over a foot that's completely unlocked. Our goal would be to have a foot that's adequately resupinated by mid stance to lock the talus against the calcaneus in the sagittal plane. 